Thank you and welcome this afternoon. It's a beautiful day in Florence, but unfortunately we have to do it with Zoom. I'm pleased that we're gonna have this webinar on the presentation of the 23rd Geneva Report. The report has been done by Agnès Benassi Query, which is now the chief economist in the French treasury, but also on leave from the Sorbonne and the Paris PSE, or Paris School of Economics. We work together at the European Economic Architecture Research Policy Network of the CPR, as she was leading. And she had been advising and in the French Council of Economic Advisors and many more places. Elga Barsic unfortunately cannot be here, but was also a co-author, uh, head of the research on BlackRock Investment in Institute, and had been also a chef in European economies in the Mar Morgan Stanley in London. Giancarlo Corsetti was with us, and you probably might know, he is now a professor at Cambridge University, and most important, he will have been here as a peer runner chair in the past. He will be one of the presenters together with Xavier Lebrun, who is a research advisor in the Department of National Bank of Belgium, and was for a long time in the Fiscal Affairs or Research Department of the IMF. So I will not take more time and let them start the presentation and then we will move to the final discussion. Okay, so let me first thank uh, the European University Institute and Ramon Marimon in particular for hosting us as well as Catherine, Ricardo and Guntram for agreeing to discuss our work. Uh, but most importantly, I, I really wanna thank again uh, my uh, co-authors uh, because this has been really uh, a, a learning experience. It's been a very productive and enriching uh, collaboration as far as, as I'm concerned. So when we started to work on the report, it, it, it clearly wasn't uh, obvious for us how urgent the issue of ensuring a proper coordination between monetary and fiscal policies would become. But the COVID-19 crisis brought us there much faster than we would have thought possible. Today, the debate on the right mix between monetary and fiscal policy is intense, and not surprisingly, views are evolving as we keep learning from real-time data and from intense efforts by academic research to clarify what really remains a rich set of intricate conceptual issues, or at least sometimes intricate conceptual issues. Of course, uh, what is already a complex coordination problem between a single central bank and a, and a single treasury takes a whole new dimension in the peculiar context of an incomplete monetary union such as the euro area. And by incomplete, I obviously mean the fact that there is no uh, single treasury uh, in the euro area. So our report uh, first sets the scene in which we, are, we outline our take of the history of economic thinking on the policy mix. This will be the, the first chapter of the report. We then we offer a summary of the empirical evidence on monetary and fiscal uh, policies and how they move together, how they you know, uh, play together or play against each other. And the last or the next two chapters of the report explore the role of tail events. They look at historical examples of monetary fiscal coordination and they draw some preliminary policy conclusions, which, as I said, are still evolving presentation after presentation of this report. Of course, like my co-authors, I would like to insist on the fact that I speak in my uh, strictly personal capacity and not as a member of the staff of the National Bank of Belgium or the European Fiscal Board. Now, uh, the overarching theme of our report is uh, that the classic way to think about uh, the policy mix, and now I think we can move to slide two, uh, the overarching theme uh, in our report is that the classic way to think about the policy mix has been turned on its head by an extraordinary combination of tail events requiring exceptional macroeconomic policy stimulus and limited policy space on both sides of the mix. That is, we have uh, a low air star to start with and already very high public debts even before the crisis. So policy space is limited. For many years, one took for granted that monetary policy was the main instrument to stabilize the macroeconomy and the business cycle. At best, fiscal policy had to try not to come in the way, 
But if it did, the central bank had the means to offset whatever destabilizing influence fiscal decisions could have on aggregate demand. In such circumstances, monetary and fiscal instruments could be seen as strategic substitutes. In that game, coordination failures could be handled by a clear division of labor. Monetary policy aims at keeping aggregate demand close to aggregate supply to avoid undesirable price developments, whereas fiscal policy must make sure that governments run its, their business in a way that keeps public debt on a sustainable trajectory. However, faced with falling real equilibrium interest rates and rising public debt after the global financial crisis, it became clear that policy space was shrinking rapidly. So the central bank's monopoly on delivering macro stabilization was in doubt. And this is precisely when we picked up the idea to write the report on the policy mix at Hugo Panizza's suggestion. Now, add the, to the situation the realization of a massive tail risk to a depleted policy space, and you inevitably get in a duopoly where fiscal policy also has to deliver macro stabilization along with monetary policy. And in our view, this is precisely what turns the traditional way of thinking about monetary fiscal interactions upside down. Instead of being strategic substitutes, the two instruments become strategic complements. Indeed, both policymakers now have a stake in stabilizing the economy, and they make each other's job easier by creating policy space for one another. Understanding this fundamental shift in the monetary fiscal game conjecture is critical to perceive the difference between independent actions by monetary and fiscal policymakers in the respect of each institution's mandate and unhealthy coordination between monetary and fiscal authorities, a manifestation of which could be labeled fiscal dominance. Next comes the challenge of returning to the normal game in which both instruments would be back to the middle of the road, as Tobin used to say. This was indeed one of the lessons drawn by early thinking on the policy mix, but Giancarlo will elaborate on that. So now switch, switching to uh, a slide, uh, slide uh, three, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a, a very quick uh, overview of the different authors we, we, we read, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite intensively during those months uh, when we prepared the report. And in fact, the, the history of the policy mix uh, goes back uh, uh, to, to, to Tim Bergen, who he of course realized that uh, it was nice to have independent instruments assigned to uh, specific objectives. However, in reality, all instruments affect all objectives and interact with one another. So uh, the optimal control problem uh, cannot be solved piecewise. And you have to start thinking in terms of the mix of the different policies and how they interact. Uh, Mundell, uh, as you probably remember, uh, had uh, you know extensive discussion as to how uh, uh, the different policy instruments should be assigned to specific objectives. So he had two instruments, of course, monetary and fiscal policies and two objectives, internal and external balance. Tobin introduced a, a very important idea, which, uh, which is basically a, a guiding light uh, in this report, which is the need to, to preserve the independence of each instrument. Finally, the neoclassical revolution brought about the idea that credibility is something really important. Uh, if uh, if uh, authorities are not credible, it, uh, it becomes extremely difficult to think about an effective uh, policy mix that indeed delivers macroeconomic stability. So moving to uh, the next slide, you know, this is a, a little bit of a, of a summary of how uh, I would say the, 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 the classics viewed monetary and fiscal policies as being indeed substitutes. And this is sometimes known as the uh, Tobin's uh, funnel, uh, common funnel theorem. And in that story, clearly monetary and fiscal policy together determine uh, aggregate demand. Uh, in general, when you read the literature, you conclude from the literature that uh, people really would like those two instruments to be both counter cyclical and to be both stabilizing uh, a situation which we label a congruent policy mix. 
However, you know, this is not this is not necessarily the case. That must not be the case at all times. And you will have instances where uh, fiscal policy uh, will uh, require some stabilizing monetary action to keep things uh, uh, in uh, at the right place. So uh, there were also quite a lot of discussions on how to achieve a desirable uh, nominal uh, level of, of GDP. Uh, and um, I think it's, it's Tobin again who came up with the fact that or the realization that both lose money and tight budget or tight money and loose budget could actually achieve a given level of nominal uh, of nominal GDP. And clearly the choice between these two mixes depends on their relatively different impact on growth, the external balance and debt sustainability. So uh, another overarching lesson of this literature is that yes, indeed, it is important and there is a lot of value in keeping uh, the two instruments in the middle of the road. Please do preserve your fiscal space. Otherwise, you end up in situations like the current situation, uh, which is uh, which is uh, quite challenging, obviously. So now uh, uh, we have another chapter which looks at the, at the evidence uh, on the policy mix, and I will go very quickly on this. Uh, clearly, you know, the literature was telling us it would be nice to have a uh, congruent policy mix where both instruments are countercyclical. In fact, the reality is that it's it's quite rare. Those uh, congruent policy mix are uh, are not frequent. And uh, to uh, to make that assessment, we looked at advanced economies over a relatively long period, 1986 to 2019. And, and clearly, uh, these, uh, these congruent mixes are, are, are rare. In fact, most often monetary and fiscal policies pull in different directions. Uh, but we also identify uh, cases where, of course, uh, the two policies pulling in different directions uh, is, is a manifestation of, a, of, a, of, a, of an optimal choice. There are good reasons why you may want to, to have that. And, um, you know, we discuss the occurrence of supply shocks or financial shocks, which may require some uh, one of the two instruments to actually be pro-cyclical. Now, uh, looking into uh, the causes or the, the potential factors shaping this tendency uh, to pro-cyclicality, uh, our analysis has identified mostly political factors and financial constraints on the government. By that, we mean stress on the sovereign debt market. So overall, uh, you know, uh, pro-cyclicality uh, is an issue for us because it tends to push uh, the mix away from the middle of the road. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit annoying and uh, I, we think that it's a very healthy debate to have these days uh, to uh, when we, we, we hear about you know, uh, redesigning fiscal policy rules to make sure that fiscal policy contributes more to macroeconomic stabilization. This is a, this is, this is a good development, uh, but but clearly the the, the thinking uh, needs to uh, needs to uh, continue to evolve. So now I'm going to turn the floor to to John Carlo, who is going to give you the real meaty part, uh, which is in chapters uh, three and four of our report. Thank you very much. Unless Agnes wants to jump in also, but let me, let me follow the street. Thank you again for having us. So uh, um, let me just uh, uh, elaborate on the two chapters uh, of the report that sort of try to uh, set some, you know, to, to focus on uh, uh, what we see as the main challenge today in a situation where not only we face a tail event, COVID, but we may, uh, exactly because instruments are so stretched, we may uh, um, leave through a period of uh, heightened vulnerability uh, to, to, to tail risk. Even, even mild shocks may set in motion a deterioration of the adverse loops, the, the, you know, the vicious feedback effect between banking, sovereign, income distribution, demand, that uh, without the good instruments in place uh, may create uh, you know much more endogenous damage than the size of the shock would justify you know from an exogenous point of view so the chapter three is about uh, this kind of uh, 
uh, uh, walking into the difference between the policy mix when there is a lot of space, policy space for both policies, to the policy mix when, when policy space is very uh, 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 small. So just uh, to repeat uh, very quickly, the idea of the classical view uh, is actually, if you read Tobin, it's a little bit more complicated than the funnel, <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the classical view was, uh, the, the funnel idea was actually uh, uh, almost uh, uh, an answer to a midterm exam. But if we have to instrument monetary and fiscal and two objective employment and inflation, can we get with two instruments, two objective? And, and, and Tobin say, wait a second, no, no, it's not like this because both instruments affect nominal demand on top of the funnel. And that creates, a, 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 basically they, they impinge on the, sa on the same uh, side of the equation demand and supply. So uh, uh, you, you cannot control PMY independently uh, with uh, F and M from above, right? The nominal demand, the two tabs contributes the same way. What is important is the bottom when the nominal demand, so to speak, splashes on, on uh, aggregate supply. And the classics knew that actually monetary and fiscal policy also affected the supply. So it is, this came, came back later a little bit more. So that there, there are conditions when, you know, through taxes, investment, uh, uh, growth friendly policy, but also credibility of monetary policy that makes a given level of aggregate demand split into activity and prices uh, pretty different. And it was also very clear in this debate that uh, it, it was uh, any policy mix, even to talk about policy mix, you need to have independent instruments that in the mind of the classics were to be preserved by independent decision maker uh, uh, centers. So uh, Tim Bergen view of coordination was clearly acknowledged, but it was also, uh, and it was also understood that no instrument could be subordinated, no, no decision making could be subordinated to another decision maker center because there would be no policy mix to speak of. So when we went to look into this kind of backward thinking, you know, the, the, the background uh, deep thinking of the classics, we actually realize a beautiful bridge also to modern macroeconomics in terms of credibility, in terms of uh, you know, the theory of, of, uh, um, of uh, uh, inflation targeting uh, and modern, mod modern macro in a way. Now, what it, of course, the other link was the fact that sometimes instruments are not, do not have policy space. And that is where the modalities of engagement change. And this is where we are now, basically. But the lessons from the classic still stand, which is, OK, complementarity. We need to use all the instruments. OK, we need to even guess new instruments. We need to search for new instruments, right? To, to, but, but also, we need to be completely aware that uh, each instrument influences the space and the credibility of the others. Each center of decision, policy decision, influences the space and the credibility of the others. And I, I insist on credibility because, you know, like if, if this become what Xavier was, was calling vicious coordination or non-good coordination, which is subordination, which is sort of, then we, we, the, the, uh, there is no more credibility, there is no more space, there is no more, uh, effectiveness of the instrument. So we went through in the, in the uh, uh, report, we went to uh, a little bit of a controversial area. Uh, and the controversial area is the fact that, of course, you know, uh, having a monetary expansion that lower borrowing cost, uh, it creates space for fiscal policy. That, in a way, is obvious. Clearly, however, clearly, however, it, the moment in which this is stretched, this is taken for granted. Uh, 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 it, it cannot be but uh, uh, a problem because you know if you have uh, if you lose control of inflation you create uh, you create uh, uh, inflation risk premia in the borrowing cost you know uh, any any effort to pursue expansionary monetary policy may end up uh, being counterproductive. The other side of it is the fact that as shown in the uh, European Union. Uh, there is a common interest in maintaining very stable condition in the government debt market. And that, in that, monetary policy can make a difference. 
by basically implicitly or explicitly offering a backstop of the uh, 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 government bond market. Now, uh, um, uh, the example of the OMTs in Europe come to mind, but at the end of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the day, there is the story that, you know, it, it's a sort of a very delicate mechanism by which, uh, you know, the central bank may, must be there frowning upon market with a big bazooka. So with this idea of unlimited, which is already a, a, a tricky point, and also with willingness to act, but it can only be effective if he maintains, if he maintains control on, on, on monetary aggregates and inflation. So the, the monetary backstop of government debt is not a free lunch. It needs, you know, it needs to be embedded in still credibility of monetary policy and control on inflation. And what is confusing for some in this mechanism is that clearly when the central bank does QE or does this kind of intervention, there is value at risk because even a liquidity support, uh, there, is, there may be some tail uh, residual probability of things going wrong. There is value at risk. And this value at risk uh, may be a problem ex ante and ex post. Ex ante may be a problem if it makes the central bank reluctant to act. If value risk becomes so important that the central bank does not enter in, the, in this game, uh, you know, we saw in the European Union what happened when there is this kind of markets do not believe that the central bank would be able to, to, to uh, stabilize markets. So it's, uh, it's very costly. Exposed is equally defeating the idea that uh, the central bank would be cavalier, enter this, this, uh, this game, and then suffer enormous loss. And uh, with this loss, basically uh, lose monetary control. Uh, more and more in, in debates, uh, there, there is this, this idea that debt in the central bank is no longer debt. <laughs> that you can put debt in the central bank and, and, and cancel it is clearly uh, not the case, right? From the, you just substitute a certain kind of bonds with other kind of liabilities, but that is that, and, and it cannot be magically uh, uh, sent to the to Mars or to the other space. So they, we, in, in in the report, we are trying to understand exactly the power, the conditions, and the limit of this idea of complementarity, where actually the institutional reform that today or the review of the of the strategic. Uh, the strategic reviews in many central bank is actually, uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's one of the most uh, uh, delicate items because on the one hand, you want to intervene. On the other hand, you want to maintain control over inflation, over, over your, your procedures and over your monetary framework. So it is, a, um, it is a, a, an important uh, uh, aspect on which we did some, you can read the report as doing all the background work, the institutional aspect, perhaps is the unwritten chapter of the report. Uh, and the, 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 is the written chapter in the wall at this point, I would say that there is no clear way in which we can reform the rule of engagement. So uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, idea that um, um, basically looking into the classic with this obsession to preserve credibility and space, obsession, this very important commitment to understand how to preserve the real space. We think that, you know, like a way to look forward to change the engagement of policymakers in view of the challenge of their risk would be to sort of understand that we need to build back resilience. Let me be kind of obvious. We need to build back resilience. We use the expression going back to the middle of the road, which is basically building back a situation where space is there and independence is granted and instruments work. So how do we build back resilience, right? Uh, and, uh, clearly, we have, we, we, have, we have a window there, right? We, 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 we sort of provocatively, we, we are presenting the idea that our star, which uh, in this graph, uh, in case you <laughs> have not seen it, it's yet another graph. The R star is very low. There is an opportunity, R star minus G is negative in some countries. So clearly, our idea is to say that we, we sort of, we, we could use R star, uh, the idea of R star as a global 
public good in the sense that it would be an indicator of going back to, uh, uh, to the middle of the road, to rebuild resilience. Now, uh, uh, we realize, or I realize, that we need to be very clear what we mean, right? So R minus G today is uh, creating a window for action, cheap borrowing cost. Uh, 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 this window may close for many bad reasons, <laughs> okay? So we, we, we don't advocate that. We don't want an IR, 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 IR star for the bad reasons of, uh, you know, a depressed economy uh, uh, with default risk or inflation risk price into borrowing costs. This would be a tragedy. If anything, building resilience means that windows, we would like to, to build the windows, to build the, the to, sorry, to close the window R minus G to, 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 to come back to normality for the good reason at the appropriate time. So the, uh, the, there could be ways of losing control and having back uh, uh, risks in terms of the full risk, inflation risk, that clearly is, is not the way to increase our star. Remember, our star is basically the price of uh, the, the, the return on a safe asset. Uh, it cannot be solved the problem by creating risk in, in government bonds. Uh, uh, it could be closed for good reason, and this good reason is, you know, policy that sort of help rebuilding potential growth, policies that uh, address some of the issues in uh, the uh, uh, in the inefficiency that may cause a lower star. Right? There is aging. There is uh, uh, technological issues. There are many factors on a star that are not policy. But remember, a star is also a there is also a policy footprint there. And, and one of the policy footprint is not only the need to uh, uh, address uh, um, COVID, but also the idea that there could be uh, 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 market failures or distortions that uh, you know, let uh, precautionary saving build up without channeling into productive investment. So this is the, the challenge to understand how to reduce uncertainty, uh, create uh, maybe address the excess saving problem, but also create a, a much larger, uh, much better efficient pro uh, productive use of, uh, of resources. And coming to Europe, of course, we cannot but make a comment on the fact that one of the reasons why our star is low is perhaps because the supply of safe asset is low. And uh, this is one of the big challenge for the European Union. How to, you know, if that is one of the distortion, like a too little production of, uh, to little supply of a safe asset, this safe asset may be uh, supplied. So uh, the, um, the, the chapter include, uh, uh, we didn't want to go into modeling the new, we thought it was too long of an of, of a, uh, endeavor for us to, to do, like modeling new models of uh, interaction of fiscal monetary policy, but we, we prefer to br bring back some historical example the uh, ILCOR control. Uh, we picked the ILCOR control for two reasons. First, because it's something that every, every central bank is playing with a little bit with the idea, because it would be sort of natural, <laughs> a natural uh, um, uh, temptation or a natural way to go, maybe good way to go in the next few years. But on the other hand, historically, it's also shown, uh, it's a beautiful example of how once you slip into this kind of uh, implicit uh, obligation or coordination with core control with the fiscal policy, going out is not uh, a plain uh, goal. It's, not a, you know, it's an activity that requires some, creates some difficulties, there are some hurdles, may create some rupture. So we review uh, examples in the past of uh, how the ill core control has been uh, then tuned down and, you know, like sort of uh, not abused, not misused, especially in the, in the US in the 50s. Uh, uh, and again, if you read, uh, you may know, you may be very well uh, versed, you may know that the example, but if you read our report, it's, it's a way to refresh your memory that sometimes conditions help, sometimes conditions help, a little bit of inflation scare help, for example, in the 50s. So let me conclude with this idea of going back to the, to, going back to the, uh, uh, middle of the road in which we insist. I think that the challenge now is basically to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we get out with no rush from a situation where clearly the 
uh, main priority is to create space and, and maintain credibility of instruments. And uh, the second part, maintaining credibility of instruments is where things become uh, complicated. And I would propose I just stop here because I'm sure it will, there will be a lot of discussion. So I, I may come back with the report or uh, actually would, I don't know whether Agnes would you like to add anything to my brief uh, distortions of the report, <laughs> but uh, it, it will be. Maybe I should stop here and leave it to the to the uh, discussion with this idea that uh, uh, you know perhaps there is a way in which policy post COVID nineteen policy, despite the tragedy of the COVID, may create uh, a little bit of awareness and opportunity for uh, you know starting to back paddle into a situation of <laughs> policy normality, you know, policy normalization. Uh, uh, instead of uh, walking you know, this uh, plank of uh, vulnerability to a risk, you know, every corner is basically a, 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 can be a very dangerous corner over the relevant horizon. Thank you. Thank you, Giancarlo, and thank you, Javier, too. It's, I know it's not simple to summarize a, a long report in just a few minutes, but uh, I think it's good to put the, the main points and we can go into the discussion. Uh, we, we have a very balanced by, uh, panel and I'm very pleased on that. So I'm gonna have just very briefly, uh, Catherine Mann, she's a global chief of economies in Citibank. So this happened from the private sector. She also had a great experience at USCD, the chief economist. On the academic and research side, we have the Ricardo Rice, uh, professor at the LSC. A Phillips professor on the Phillips curve. And he's also director of the ESRC Center on Macroeconomics in UK. And on the side of more directly policy, we have Gundram Wall, which is the director of Brugo, one of the leading uh, think tanks. So I think that's a good balance. And I just, we're going to start exactly in this order, uh, have the first round of interventions by the panel. Thanks. Well, thank you very much um, for the introduction and really for the opportunity to come and talk about this report. Um, I am going to um, make some comments uh, against the backdrop of, of where we are now um, and also make some comments that uh, <clears throat> sort of draws on <clears throat> both my previous hat as being the chief economist at the OECD and my uh, current hat being the chief economist at uh, Citi. Perhaps the best way to put both of those hats on at the start is to make the observation uh, from a policy perspective, from the OECD perspective, is that fiscal and monetary policy are always strategic complements, or they should be. Um, and the challenge is to make them strategic complements, make them complementary so that they're working together. Uh, but clearly, as uh, Giancarlo and Xavier uh, put forward in the report, a lot of times they are not uh, strategic complements. They're often substitutes or uh, even worse, uh, working at cross purposes. Um, and I think we can kind of come down to the two uh, tensions that we have, um, political tensions, which are particularly manifest in the fiscal tool, uh, fiscal space, and of course, market tensions, which are particularly manifest in the monetary policy space. So frequently the reason why we cannot have the middle of the road is because we have politics on the one hand that constrain uh, the, both the deployment and the, and the choices uh, within the fiscal space. And then on the other hand, in the monetary, uh, the, the uh, market tensions that constrain or affect the transmission of monetary policy to the real economy. Um, so with that as a backdrop, I would like to put up some slides based on kind of where we are. So we'll be trying to do that. We should be able to do that. Uh, so I wanted to, I do think it's important to put a backdrop on this. I mean, this report was uh, started uh, prior to COVID, but of course it's now being um, uh, presented and being assessed in light of where we are with COVID. So I do think it's important to kind of put where uh, kind of some, some uh, real data and projections on that. What you're seeing here is both real data and the projections that we have internal to city. We do these projections every month 
based and build them up to the global level based on our uh, country economists around the world. Uh, what you see here is uh, where we are with regard to um, the projections for the US, the Euro area and China, three major drivers of the global economy. We've presented this in a somewhat different way than, than some people do, rather than the actual growth rates uh, that you that would normally see in a projection exercise. These are presented as standard deviations from historical experience from the last 20 years. Um, you can see the depth of the COVID shock. We we're talking about the tail risk. Indeed it was, it was a five standard deviation shock uh, about twice the size of the uh, global financial crisis. So I think we do, uh, it's important to put that into perspective. Uh, and you can also see the extent to which there is a multi-speed rebound following the uh, downturn in COVID uh, with uh, China actually rebounding uh, relatively less compared to historical experience, only a three standard deviation rebound and going through the sort of the near term projection exercise, uh, it's uh, projected to have a one and a half standard deviation um, moderation in its growth rate compared to historical experience. So it's really not going to be a major driver of global uh, growth going forward. Comparing the US and Europe, I think is very important um, because uh, both uh, large advanced economy areas, uh, both playing a very important role in terms of uh, global economic performance. And of course, um, in that regard, the fiscal and monetary policy stances that the Euro area and uh, the United States take uh, and the implications of those for their growth rates are going to be very important for the overall landscape for the global economy, but also are going to have very big implications for each other. They are neither one of them exist in a vacuum and how the monetary and fiscal policy stances in the US and the Euro area uh, play against each other or don't or play with each other or, or not is an important ingredient to um, our prospects going forward and for this political and market uh, tensions that might get revealed as we go forward. And so what you can see here, of course, is that the, the standard deviations way of presenting growth rates show quite a bit of differentiation between prospects for the Euro area and for the United States. Uh, with the, both of them came out of COVID, but then uh, very rapidly uh, having a very different approach uh, to uh, our outcomes, at least from the standpoint of our economists who address these issues. So I wanna move now to kind of looking at um, kind of what this means in terms of, whoops, in terms of, um, in terms of what way we think about policy strategies uh, and the interplay between the, uh, the two. So on the fiscal side, on the left-hand side, what you're looking at is for the US and the Euro area, and we've got China in here as well, is the magnitude and the composition of fiscal policy um, in the COVID crisis and uh, potentially going forward. Very clear that the United States has, and this is done before the most recent uh, package that has been passed by the House and it's under consideration in the Senate. Uh, the United States uses, you know, has really attacked this problem with a much bigger fiscal bazooka, uh, a much bigger amount and as a percentage of GDP and the tools it has chosen to use in terms of the composition disproportionately magnitude of direct payments, not furloughs, not uh, that sort of not guarantees, but direct payments. And that has a big implication for immediacy when we think about the, um, the, the impact on on the uh, growth rate for the US economy. So magnitude, very different, composition, very different. And I'm gonna make a, a remark about composition being uh, particularly relevant going forward is what is the composition in terms of life preservers, which is I think what every government is doing right now, uh, making up for uh, lost revenues in the case of business making up for the lost income, uh, through what are different means for, for individuals. But what really matters going forward is in fact, uh, moving forward with a composition that is focused on uh, activating or catalyzing private sector activity, particularly private sector investment. And in this regard, I would argue that 
the uh, European Recovery and Resilient Funds or Next Gen EU, uh, which does have more of a focus on uh, catalyzing private sector investment for digital and and green or could, we're not quite sure, uh, could, uh, that has a much uh, greater potential going forward for uh, producing this catalyst for private sector investment to move forward with the underpinnings of more rapid growth for the Euro area and more sustainable rapid growth for the Euro area going forward. Whether or not the United States in its infrastructure bill is going to be able to do that, I think is a question mark. Uh, there's a big plan, uh, you know, two, two or three trillion dollars, um, which is supposed to have green elements to it. But um, whether or not uh, that additional spending can be uh, passed uh, in the same budget year as 1.9 trillion of life preserver support. I think that's a super, I, I think that's a difficult question to answer. This is where some of the political tensions that I mentioned on the deployment of fiscal policy uh, becomes uh, important. Now, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, monetary policy, uh, again, very different approaches to monetary policy in terms of magnitude, the size of the balance sheets uh, and the uh, nature of the tools, asset purchases versus, for example, a TLTRO or a PEP. Um, versus what the UN, United States, uh, the Federal Reserve has been choosing to do. Um, a lot of that has to do with the differential in the transmission mechanism, uh, whether it's through principally asset markets, which is the US case, or in the credit markets and, and lending markets, the bank channel, which is the European case. Uh, what I think is important in either case and what is displayed in the right-hand panel here is we're looking at the relationship in this panel between financial conditions in the light blue line and uh, real GDP in the dark blue. Now you've got our forecast for real GDP in there. That's, you know, whatever it is, that's, that's okay. We, we are not really looking at that right now. What we are looking at is the wide uh, gap in 2016, 17, and 18 between uh, very loose financial conditions and uh, a deterioration in GDP growth. Um, and that is that transmission gap where there's been a tremendous amount of monetary policy put into the system is manifested in term, and at the time it was manifested in low sovereign rates, um, the very low R star, uh, higher equity markets, uh, more robust credit conditions, um, but yet it had no traction. It did not have traction to increase GDP. And that gap between monetary policy impetus, the, uh, the capture of monetary policy impetus in the financial sector, rather than it being transmitted through the financial sector to the real economy is a challenge going forward for the additional dramatic efforts that monetary policy is putting into the system right now. It also, raises very clearly this tension that the central banks are presented with because the more they push, the more you capture it, uh, or at least so far, there's been a capture of the monetary policy impetus in the financial sector without it being uh, transmitted to the uh, real economy. So I'd like to sort of move forward to just a uh, uh, final uh, two uh, points, which is <clears throat> what if what we're doing on the fiscal side is not enough and what if it's too much? So um, this is the macro 101 picture that at least I grew up with at uh, MIT, um, which is you have the trend. And so we're looking at the macro 101 picture there. Uh, the trend line in GDP uh, is there in the, in the upward sloping line, right? Uh, then you have the cycle, which is the COVID cycle where we have a collapse in the, uh, so we're looking at the curve line. We have a collapse, we have lost GDP. Then we have the implementation of fiscal and monetary policy in order to boost the recovery to have a, not just a rebound, but an actual recovery. So you're going above the trend line. And then of course, the question is, what happens? Is there private sector investment so it improves the trend line? Or is there uh, too much inflation which induces fiscal and monetary policy uh, makers to tighten because of inflation fears 
And then of course you end up with a bust. So this is kind of, as I say, macro 101. <clears throat> the inset panel on the left-hand side draws the actual data after the global financial crisis. There was a trend growth in global GDP in the dark blue and then the light blue line was the trend prior to the GFC. And then you can see what actually happened after the GFC, a step down, but there was never a recovery. There was a return to the growth rate, but as a step down, because there was insufficient fiscal and monetary policy response following the global financial crisis to make up, to actually recover lost GDP. And in fact, you had a 5% to 7% loss in, in global GDP. And the burden of that was lower R star. So anybody who was a saver through uh, investment uh, in, in um, interest bearing assets was hurt. We also had widening inequality as lower income people did not have job uh, opportunities. And finally, of course, intergenerational inequality increased as well as uh, younger people had a lower lifetime earnings trajectory. And all of that we know because we have the data uh, to evaluate that. So here we are with our projections, okay? So the left-hand side shows where we are now uh, in the dark blue line, shows the trend for GDP prior to COVID. This is again, looking at the global, but we could look at it for individual economies and regions, but this is for the global. And you can see our city baseline, what I was uh, showing you in, in terms of standard deviations in the first slide. The city baseline shows that you never recover. You never recover. You just barely eke your way back to uh, where we are, uh, where, where to the trend line and not by until 2024. So all this period of time, there's deteriorating capital, labor market scarring and no inflation. Going on to the right-hand slide, the dark blue for 2021 and 2022 are cities own economists expectations for inflation for advanced economies in 2021 and 2022 below 2%. So in the current configuration where there is a lot of fiscal, but we don't believe actually it's going to be deployed because there are things that governments say that they're going to do, but they actually don't do them and they don't have traction. Uh, you end up with no recovery and no inflation. So this is bad news uh, because you know, we, we know what the consequences are of that. So we have another exercise which takes the city baseline and then adds in what governments say that they're gonna do. So it's a, it's a fixed, fixed significantly larger fiscal stimulus and monetary uh, accommodation, maintained accommoda uh, accommodation relative to what our own economists say is going to be the traction. So we're putting this into the Oxford economics model. So we're getting spillovers that become spillbacks and collective action as opposed to individual action, which is what the individual economists uh, write into their forecasts. So we get the benefits of collective action, which if you remember when I did these presentations at the OECD, we also talked there about the, ben the higher multipliers that come from collective action. Well, we're seeing it again. So we do get recovery, really robust recovery. But then what happens? Uh, then do we end up with this inflation concern and the retrenchment that fiscal and monetary policy makers will react with um, discipline, uh, perhaps too much discipline, perhaps the wrong type of discipline, um, and then uh, we end up with a bust. So looking again over at the right-hand panel, we're looking at the inflation because inflation will be the signal. Inflation will be the signal that um, it's time to retrench. So 2021, the teal colored bar there for advanced economies under the uh, more robust scenario, you've got uh, a 3% inflation rate, no problems, or arguably under the flexible average inflation targeting for the United States, surely no problems. Uh, you know, ECB, we haven't, they haven't finished their strategic review yet, so question mark there, but it's a 3% for the advanced economy as a whole. The 2022, of course, is the one where we start to get this incredibly scary 5.5% inflation for advanced economies. Do we think that that actually is going to be the inflation outcome in 2022? 
Well, of course, that's a, an important question. And a lot of the other work that we've done on the inflation process, where inflation is a function of inflation expectations, commodity prices, and tightness in labor and product markets, particularly that last one, product markets, makes us believe that this 2022 um, uh, outcome is probably not in the cards because pricing power of firms, which is where tightness and product, uh, product markets come from, you only get inflation if you have broad-based, sustained, and systematic rising uh, prices at, by firms. Do they believe that they can systematically increase their prices year after year, quarter after quarter? We don't think so. Menu costs are still very important. We do think there will be a spike, absolutely, for a bunch of different reasons. Step up, yeah, but no systematic rise that would uh, lead to this 5.5% inflation in 2022. So um, that's kind of gives you a picture of uh, where we think the uh, rubber hits the road with regard to the uh, issue of monetary and fiscal policy and how it is being deployed and uh, what are the challenges going forward the facing the fiscal and monetary policy authorities uh, and how the markets may well react uh, or are reacting to some of these uh, prospects that they see. So I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Catherine. And I must say, if the ones who are not in the panel, they want to ask questions and questions, use the chat facility. I would hope we're gonna have time for this broader discussion. Ricardo? Great, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, you know, over the last few decades, there was an increasing uh, separation of fiscal and monetary policy. That came because those different tools started becoming more and more separated in different institutions, the treasury versus central bank, and because each one of them was given somewhat different, even if hopefully complementary, intermediate objectives towards the common goal, which is ultimately human welfare. Now, there are some benefits in that separation, important ones, most economists know what they are, although, as is often the case, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. Uh, first, because it creates unnecessary conflicts in pursuing the ultimate common goal. And second, because when one of the separate arms of policy exhausts its ability or space to push in the right direction, you may need the other one to go beyond what individually could have been optimal in order to pursue the common good. This report is a very important pushback against these past sins, if you want of over-exaggerating the separation between fiscal and monetary policy. I will not use my 10 minutes to review the report. It is a great piece of work. It's published already. I will only say that I recommend that all should read it. It is a mix of thoughtful history of ideas on the separation, a lucid discussion of the trade-offs, and a quite courageous attempt to address questions for which there's no easy answers. Instead, what I'm going to provide is a discussion of some interactions in monetary fiscal policy that one complement those discussed in the report. Uh, and second, at the request of Ramon, our gracious host, uh, focusing on 2021-22, something that the authors did not have the luxury of doing as they were writing this report before COVID hit in earnest and with all the change that has brought. I'm gonna to try to make four points focusing on the four goals going from monetary to fiscal policy and throughout, of course, emphasizing monetary fiscal interactions. The first intermediate goal target of a central bank, uh, anchoring expected inflation. This is the main goal of any self-respecting central bank, to create trust in the currency such that it is used as a unit of account in a stable way. Now, in this regard, I find the ECB in 2021, 22, again, my horizon, to be facing a difficult challenge. It's difficult because it is hard to see how it can cut short-term rates much more. We can see that we are either at the effective lower bound or very near it when one opens the newspaper, as I did a couple of days ago, and heard about German banks telling depositors to stop depositing, not to take digital money, but to hold hard currency, given how low interest rates are on the deposits. Cutting long-term interest rates in turn through QE and for guidance also seems to be very limited at the point that we are. They're just so very low as well. 
But that means that the classic solution, if inflation expectations drift down towards deflation, which is to aggressively cut interest rates, seems to be um, not there or not to be much room to do so. But in the other direction as well, the problem is not uh, easier. Imagine long run inflation expectations rise. The typical solution would be to raise interest rates. Now, if that happens in 2024 or 25, so be it. The ECB has a well-earned reputation for focusing on its anchors of not being afraid to raise interest rates if needed. However, imagine this happens in the next six to 18 months. Then things are much harder. An unwinding of QE that would allow long-term rates to rise would put enormous pressure in the Eurozone's fragmented sovereign debt markets. And even at the union as a whole, the size of the public debt is just so large now as a response to the expansion of the last 12 months, that this would have a very direct account on the public effect accounts. There is a large monetary fiscal interaction in the sense of a large footprint of monetary policy on the public accounts that is just very hard to ignore in the short run. Moreover, note that the ECB in its December restatement of the motivation for QE has said that they're trying to keep the real year curve low already anticipating this problem if you want and doing it very well, which is you do not want to cop the nominal rate. You will raise nominal rates if, if expected inflation indeed goes up. But drawing this distinction between real and nominal in real time communication is a very, very hard challenge. If the central bank is not raising or lowering rates when expected inflation becomes an anchored, then interest rates, Taylor principles are no longer anchoring inflation. What takes its place? Well, from a monetarist perspective, it is the commitment to have no monetary financing of deficits, to not using seniorage and money printing in order to uh, generate quick revenues. Ultimately, it is a fiscal commitment that prevents us from printing currency in, and therefore keeps uh, inflation expected longer inflation anchored. From a more direct fiscal perspective, it is the trust that the nominal claims issued by the central bank and the government as a whole will keep a steady real value. That is that surpluses will stay stable, the fiscal responsibility will stay in terms of budget balance so that there is no run from nominal to real assets causing a bout of inflation. And so it is on long run. Either way, monetarists or fiscalists, it is long run fiscal sustainability. That is, it is the monetary authority is dependent on the fiscal sustainability of the long run in order to keep expected inflation anchored it no longer can just rely on its interest rates and its independence to do so. Second, actual inflation relative to expected inflation, the principle of the Phillips curve, that those deviations will arise because of changes in real activity. Here, as Catherine just discussed, fiscal expansion can lead inflation to rise. And as she noted, she even had this striking, uh, I wouldn't call it a forecast, that in 2022, could inflation go as high as 5.5% in the US? I'll just note, Catherine, that if you go and try and uh, buy a call option on inflation being above 5% in the US for 2022, the price of that right now is zero, meaning no one will sell it to you. So it seems like the markets are going to get a big shock if that is what's coming in 2022. For the Eurozone, though, taking uh, for the Eurozone, though, I would say that the ECB and the Eurozone is in a good place right now, at least relative to the US. First, because the fiscal expansion is not as large. Second, because with expected inflation having been quite significantly below target uh, over accumulated over the last few years, even if inflation exceeds expected inflation, we're still talking inflation of two, two and a half percent with expected inflation at one and a half right now. Of course, moreover, the slope of the Phillips curve just does not seem to be quite as large to justify seeing the fiscal packages that we see generating an inflation that would be much above two and a half or 3%. And even if we end up with inflation above 2% for a few years, that just does not seem like a very big deal to me, given how we have been significantly below 2% for now five or six years in a row. More important is the monetary reaction to this and the credibility of the central bank in it. As such, the rev current revision of the MANA DCB understanding and explaining, or just stating even, uh, even if there's not full agreement on this, that it is a medium long run, medium goal, the price stability one, which is not inconsistent with inflation being somewhat above target. It is on average inflation being around 2%, perhaps even imparting some history dependence 
seems to be the way in which the fiscal authority will have a good imprint on, uh, sorry, the way the monetary authority should respond to the imprint that the fiscal authority can do with it, but I would not be more worried beyond that. Third point, now moving towards the fiscal authority's intermediate goals and the monetary footprint on them, talking about the government budget constraint. Governments have borrowed in the Eurozone as elsewhere, and this was the right thing to do. Facing an unprecedented aggregate shock, the nation as a whole wants to borrow from the future to assist those that are deeply affected, to fund health efforts, to smooth consumption, to keep long-term scars from emerging the economy. Facing long-term interest rates that are now very much below expected growth rates, and partly as a result of the excess savings that the fall in consumption due to confinement uh, and the large government transfers caused, it would have made sense to have locked those long-term interest rates. European governments did that to some extent, but from my humble perspective, much too little and in a somewhat feeble way. Moreover, here, QE, the actual central bank, and did part of this. It replaced long-term government borrowing with overnight deposits or of banks of the central bank or overnight borrowing of the government as a whole from the perspective of its full of funds. This was inevitable, so I am not saying it should not have been done, but it is consequential. It implies a large fiscal risk for the central bank in that if default cost risk rises, not in the short run, but at some point of fears over the next five or 10 years, in any one area of the Eurozone, the central bank suffers a loss right away by paying the interest rates it does on the short-term reserves while suffering a loss, a fall in the prices of the bonds that it holds. This can even become self-fulfilling insofar as if indeed there is an anchoring inflation expectations for fiscal reasons that raises expected inflation, then the increase in the long-term interest rate will cause right away losses to the central bank and potentially the danger that the central bank responds by letting inflation rise in the short run to offset those losses, leading us to a bad equilibrium at all. In short, that the QE as tied to the hip, the, the fates of the solvency of both the central bank and the government in a way that uh, is in one part inevitable, but one to cause concerns or to worry about. Fourth and final point, I think I'm in, yes, I have two minutes still. Fourth and final point on R minus G. Fourth and final point on, on interest rates being below uh, government spending. In 2020, all institutions from the OECD to the IMF to most economists, for the reasons I just discussed, recommended that governments would run large deficits. The fact that interest rates on the debt were so low meant that governments could even run what is sometimes colorfully called a deficit gamble. That is, borrow a lot now, plan to pay it over a prolonged period of time, and hope that as growth rises, the share, those payments will become a very small share of your future income. It is a gamble, and the reason why the literature before it called it a gamble, because the interest rates can quickly turn on you, or the government or the growth rate turn on you, and that interest rates can spike up, and the beneficial R minus G can become a very, a very bad one, especially in the context where we can have multiple equilibrium in sovereign debt markets. The central bank is all over Europe. Countries have played the deficit gamble in the last six months. And by the way, it's no coincidence that those scarred by sovereign debt problems, think here of Portugal or Greece, were willing to gamble much less than, say, Germany, which took a much larger gamble. Uh, but for these gambles to, let's say, at least lower a little bit the possibility of them collapsing, the central bank plays a very big role in preventing precisely the multiple equilibrium the spikes in interest rates that um, several economists, well, one of them is the author of this report, Giancarlo, has worked hard on, um, has worked to clarify. This is when it comes to the deficit gambles of transfer spending. Central banks for a while are going to be crucially uh, tied to preventing these multiple equilibriums to whatever it takes speeches while we pay off this large debt. Permanent spending and turning to next gen U and all the spendings well, some of that relies in part and is important on the fact that currently on the government debt, governments are earning a premium by being able to issue it at such low interest rates. That premium arises 
because government debt is perceived to be safe. But for it to continue to be perceived to be safe, it must be that inflation risk premium continue to be very low. If inflation risk premium rise through incompetence, inability, bad luck of the monetary authority, as well as fiscal actions that lead to it, fiscal authorities will have much more trouble in order to pay for it. All those wonderful EU bonds that we issue them are very much payable to sustain our great climate and digitalization goals if we don't have suddenly, uh, and our plans to issue those, if all of a sudden we don't have a jump up of inflation risk premium. Again, a tying of fiscal and monetary that will hit. Parting words. Um, as I told you, aside from the very important points they've touched, I try to raise awareness to other monetary fiscal interactions in which both have to, are going to have to interact with each other, pay attention to the other. I think all of the, I try to leave a message that all of them are manageable. All of them require the interaction, the complementarities that the authors talked about, even if I address different dimensions of that. But let me leave and with a more, um, if not pessimistic, um, because it's not a forecast, a gloomy note. 10 years ago, we saw, everyone saw exposed the big hole in the European Monetary and Financial Union. Without an EU-wide deposit insurance, a euro-wide safe asset, and a proper risk assessment of sovereign risk and bank assets, we have flight to safety and doom loop mechanics that threaten the survival of the whole monetary union. 10 years later, I have to say that I think we've done too little to plug this hole. In spite of many efforts, in fact, leaving speeches and summits and discussions, the hole remains. It drags treasuries and banks together, and so fiscal and monetary policy down and helpless. Now, in 2021, because housing markets and house prices have done fine, this, has not been, this does not seem to be potentially an issue because banks seem to be fine enough not to drag us through this hole. But the hole is still there. And as we speak about monetary fiscal interactions and potential failures of those to complement, such as the ones that I mentioned and the many more that Giancarlo um, and um, uh, sorry, Giancarlo, Agnes, and um, Elga, and then Xavier uh, mentioned, um, that is still the tail risk, the big tail risk in Europe that worries me when we think about the risks of any kind of miscoordination. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo Gundram. Well, thanks a lot, Ramon, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I very much enjoyed uh, reading the report, and, and I also enjoy very much the discussion and want to congratulate the authors for a really timely report on a key issue, which is how to play the game uh, of monetary fiscal policy coordination um, at the current uh, juncture and in general. And I think I, I overall agree with the thrust of the report that, of course, the two are complementary. Um, and uh, like Ricardo, I would like to uh, um, emphasize that in the current situation, the bigger uh, bazooka in town, um, if I can formulate it like this, certainly is, is fiscal policy. And fiscal policy um, ha has a much bigger role uh, to play um, than, than monetary. Monetary uh, policy, of course, plays the important role of preventing uh, fragmentation um, uh, in fin financing conditions across across the EU, across the Eurozone, keeping funding rates uh, low. Um, but um, at the end of the day, um, uh, the, the rate, tinkering with the rate and bringing down rates uh, further could have even unintended uh, consequences. Um, uh, so I think the real issue here is uh, what to do about fiscal policy and how to play that game. And in that respect, I, I think um, it is quite interesting to note uh, the change in tone. Um, the ECB's uh, Isabel Schnabel, of course, recently um, argued that monetary policy now operates uh, through fiscal policy, uh, which is a fundamental change of tone, um, which I think the ECB uh, would not have said like that um, five or 10 years ago. So, so there's a clearly a change in tone, uh, but there is a, a fundamental question in a monetary union of decentralized fiscal policies. Um, uh, how do you play that game? Uh, how do you coordinate the national fiscal policies? And how do you ensure um, that um, if some national fiscal policy players play fiscal dominance uh, while others do not play it, 
uh, what kind of implications do you have? And so, so, so you you talk here of middle of the road, um, which I think is a very nice term. But when reading the report, I would have wished uh, to see a little bit more fleshing out what that middle of the road really is and what it means at the current situation. Um, um, and um, the the fiscal uh, the the term fiscal dominance. I think is a, is a quite an interesting and an important term, um, and it is being taken up implicitly or explicitly in the debate on debt cancellation. We have a debate on debt cancellation, and it is no surprise that this debate of on debt cancellation, which of course, as Giancarlo rightly puts points out, uh, I mean there cannot be a, a real debt cancellation. But if you cancel debt between the treasuries and the the ECB, you, it's a way for you to ensure fiscal dominance. And it is no surprise to me that this debate um, comes very strongly from countries um, that have, of course, very high, high debt levels and limited, uh, limited fiscal space. So it is really these countries um, that um, uh, are doing quite, uh, relatively little um, fiscal policy action compared to the countries with, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, far less debt. Um, um, but th those countries uh, are vulnerable. And therefore, um, uh, the debate is very, rig very vigorous in, the, in those countries. So for me, um, I would, lo would have loved to hear a little bit more clearly, you know, what is the proposed solution to this dilemma um, that we are facing in, in the current situation. And if you could sort of um, explain in some more detail whether or not uh, we should not uh, move more, much more strongly towards uh, a solution where uh, joint um, debt, so uh, let's say a doubling of next generation EU, um, would be the, the right solution um, by uh, uh, creating that kind of um, coordination, uh, easing up that coordination game by essentially centralizing uh, the fiscal policy action. So, so I think this, uh, I guess the, the, my first point is really um, to cut a long story short, um, I would have loved to see a little bit more concretely, what are you suggesting? What is the middle of the road and how do you play the middle of the road um, uh, of fiscal monetary policy coordination in a, in a monetary union with a largely, fragment, largely decentralized fiscal policy? So, so that's that's my first point. The, the second point uh, I, I wanted to uh, to raise is uh, I, I was a little bit um, when I read the report I got a little bit agitated um, on the on the chapter um, uh, the R star chapter uh, which um, I thought and here I quote uh, I mean which I thought was going very far in and it was very explicit in the recommendation and let me quote. Um, uh, um, you, 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 you call for ASTA to be, uh, uh, to be formalized as an explicit or bit flexible policy target. And, uh, you know, when I, when I read that and then you compared it essentially with climate change and arguing, you know, we, this should be a global uh, policy target. And when I read this, I thought uh, to myself, okay, if, if that is a recommendation to policymakers on a concept that is so controversial, uh, in the economic literature, um, uh, uh, I think uh, I think uh, it's it's gonna gonna backfire uh, certainly on the political level. Um, I mean, arguing to uh, to make so something unobservable to be a policy target uh, is is usually um, quite problematic. I mean, we've done that before on the fiscal side. Um, it can create lots of tensions um, because uh, nobody agrees on what the unobservable exactly is. Um, uh, and I note also in that space, there is now a very vigorous debate, um, for example, a paper by, by Perley in the review of Keynesian economics, uh, which, you know, essentially um, argues um, that um, uh, uh, about the fallacies of um, the, uh, the, the, the R star, star concept and, you know, points out and, and argues that negative nominal rates uh, may not remedy the Keynesian demand shortages and even aggravate the problem. And, you know, this critique is now being taken up in a yet unpublished paper uh, by, by Stansbury and Summers, which uh, sort of really strongly argues that um, the notion that uh, we, can, we can find an R star 
um, that is sufficiently negative um, may be maybe just false because the IS curve is is backward 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 bending. So I think we really have a sort of here an issue um, that um, in in this space where interest rates are extremely low or even negative, there's lots of um, effects that we do not understand and. Um, I think really um, uh, that that really put limits to what uh, monetary policy can do, um, and and you know really uh, puts puts the game in again in in fiscal fiscal policy making. So so my third point um, uh, um, uh, is is really a bit more about some some practical issues, and you know I think you you have this term um, in there um, healthy growth growth um, in in the report and um, you know when thinking about healthy growth um, of course the first really structural policy issue that I I would have emphasized and uh, that needs to to be emphasized in the current situation is that that we need to get the pandemic behind us um, if if that is possible at all uh, because the currently high um, uh, savings rates um, uh, are, of course, first order a, a, a result of um, uh, of, uh, of lockdown measures and uh, and the inability of many citizens to go out there and consume. So, so really um, thinking a bit um, about you know uh, quality of um, uh, public uh, policy, quality of public governance, and the role public finance can play in improving the operation of, of the government sector, it seems to me is, is absolutely crucial. Think, think about uh, if, if we were ahead um, in, in our vaccination um, uh, campaign, if we were at the level of the UK, um, a lot of uncertainty would be removed. Um, a lot of um, investment could be done. A lot of more consumption um, could happen. So, so I think a, a very important issue really is what I call in this game, um, it's structural policy. It's not just about fiscal and monetary, it's about structural policy, it's about the quality of institutions, it's about bringing up potential growth um, uh, and thereby increasing also the supply of safe assets. It's about um, really the growth story. And you know, I think there um, we, we do see some progress um, uh, with um, uh, you know important reforms now being discussed in Italy and elsewhere, um, so so I think we we are on the right track in that space. But um, I think on the vaccination story in particular, I'm extremely worried, um, and I'm extremely worried that um, we might not even be delayed. Uh, but moreover, um, the um, uh, the um, uh, pandemic uh, might become something that is endemic, meaning we we have the virus with us for a long time. And if that is the case, um, I, I think what we, should, uh, what we should acknowledge is that um, that might also mean that um, uh, our, our potential output is much lower than we thought it is, because permanently um, we might have not, uh, certain sectors might not be operating. Um, and so then it raises lots of questions as soon as you accept that, uh, it raises lots of questions about where is um, where is um, uh, the output gap? Uh, where is inflation going to be? Um, where how much fiscal space do we really have? And and, and so on and so forth. So I think policymakers really face uh, a very significant dilemma um, because of this huge uncertainty that the pandemic um, has created, and that's a macro uncertainty. And the first policy priorities needs to be needs to be putting all available resources, political, financial, um, administrative, uh, into uh, fixing um, uh, um, the, uh, this uncertainty. I think that's, that's the first policy priority. And doing so will allow us to tremendously improve the macro picture and move into, uh, into um, a much more benign scenario where um, I think the complementarity of fiscal and, and monetary policy um, will be it will be much more easier to play it because we will know um, where um, the output gap is going to be, whether there are inflation risks, whether there are risks of rising interest rates, uh, whether there are uh, broader financial stability risks, and so on and so forth. So, so, so these were my three points. Uh, thank you very much, and again, I enjoyed reading this report a lot.
And Rundram. So we don't have a lot of time. I just wanted to ask you just a couple of things, which is following some of the last points you made, Rundram. One reads the report, which I recommend, uh, of course, to read. It's one wonders where are those guys in? Because the whole discussion is about the uh, central bank's monetary policy and the mix with the treasury, except that we don't have a treasury here in the European area. And, and, and then that makes it a little tricky because a lot of things that are being discussed is like within the ECB. And maybe that's part of the problem, that the, the, the mix is just really too much in the same place. At one point you mentioned that the role that the European Recovery Fund with the ESM and the European Investment Bank can play together when in the last chapter discussing about how to pursue this uh, R star. Um, but, uh, but we are far from that kind of coordination. On the fiscal at the UAE, European, uh, European Union level, and then of course you come with the states which gets a little more complicated. So that's something, of course, Giancarlo said is the missing chapter, but they wanted to have any views on that, I think will help a lot. And there's another element, which is uh, comparing United States and the area area. And, uh, but then if you look at the area area, there's a huge divide, which is getting wider. If you look at the Jeeps, Greece, Italy, Portugal and Spain together on one side and the others. The others is pretty much, except for the 2010, 2012 years, is pretty much doing like the States, actually better than UK, but not the others. Compare now on the forecast between you know, 2010 and 2008, well, uh, the non jeeps have gone 10% up. The chips are 10% down with the huge crisis in the case of Greece. That makes really much more difficult what is the mix here on the fiscal side. And I, I, I sort of missed that part, but uh, you guys did got a lot of work. So we don't have much time, but uh, I get back to the authors. I don't know if Agnes wants to add something to the discussion and. Uh, or uh, Giancarlo and Javier. So thanks for these uh, wonderful uh, comments. And uh, as you rightly, well, you didn't say it, but this report is just a milestone. It's not, the, of course, at the end of, of our, our thinking. So perhaps briefly to, to each uh, comments. Uh, first, Catherine, I like very much the way you put it, like uh, fiscal policy subject to Political, political constraints, whereas monetary policy is subject to market constraints, hence sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, I like it very much, but then if you think it twice, uh, it's possible that today we are seeing appearing some kind of political constraint on the ECB. Why? Because uh, since there is no inflation and no sign of inflation and for a long time, so there is kind of uh, uh, um, monetary space which is well, many people want to fill this this uh, this gap. For instance, people that want the ECB uh, to do some industrial policy uh, or fight global warming. So fill um, a space that has been left uh, by inflation and has been left also by the politicians. So there's kind of a mixture uh, in the minds of, of some. Uh, now, in terms of... Uh, you, you showed some, some graphs about discretionary fiscal policy comparing the US and the EU area. Here, I, I'm not fully uh, uh, convinced for several reasons. The first one is obvious, it's about automatic stabilizers. I'm not going to expand on this. The second one is that um, uh, I, I think the priority today is not, so I, I think we should not think about in terms of aggregate uh, demand today. So maybe our report for today, meaning the first semester of 21, uh, is not the right uh, way to think about what's happening. Why? Because of the, uh, of the constraints on the firms. 
So if the firms uh, cannot produce more, it's not the lack of demand, it's just they, ha they have constraints. So pulling more demand will not change this picture. And I think we should uh, compare the efficiency of the policies in the different countries in terms of targeting, uh, in terms of avoiding bankruptcies, avoiding poverty, uh, protecting the firms, protecting the households. And then when the, when the, the, the uh, health crisis is back behind us, then we need to, uh, the, the macro analysis will uh, come back at the forefront. So at this stage, I, I'm not really uh, impressed by these uh, comparisons. I will be impressed uh, in the second part of the year, I think. Um, and this leads me to, to uh, a question uh, about the middle of the road. Uh, you, if we identi identify some physical space, so you, you identify a physical space that could be used. For instance, you have a cap on interest payments and you think that we are below this cap and so there is a physical space. Should it be used? Uh, some people say yes, because uh, it's, there's more risk uh, to do too little than too much. Uh, but uh, according to the middle of the road <laughs> uh, narrative, uh, you, should, you should not use it. You should uh, have kind of a risk management attitude where you keep uh, some firepower powder for in case things go wrong uh, later on and when we need aggregate demand later on. So um, I, I think, uh, and this brings me to something that Guntram said about, um, uh, about uncertainty uh, about our star. Uh, and we allude to that in the report, maybe we have not expanded too much on that. Uh, when we say that our star is a global public good and we should aim at some coordination, so it could seem very naive, but what we have in mind is reducing uncertainties across the world in order to stimulate investment and to reduce uh, um, savings. I know that in the US there is a, there is a debate about, about uh, social protection and automatic, automatic stabilizers or semi-automatic stabilizers and having people better protected in order for them to, to save less or for firms to, to, to spend more, to invest more. So I, I think, uh, and I fully agree with what Guntram said about uh, the health crisis, vaccination, uh, global vaccination is the uh, uh, action that will reduce uh, the uncertainty globally, and it could have an impact on our star. So it, it's also a way uh, to lift this uh, our star. Uh, you can think about trade wars also. So maybe we should going forward, we should think about F fiscal fiscal policy, not just as aggregate demand as impacting aggregate demand, but also in a way to be the insurer in last resort. Uh, we, we have the ECB, of course, lend of last resort. But uh, the, um, it, it doesn't know where the risk is uh, in, in the real economy. So it, we need uh, fiscal policy as an insurer uh, for households, for firms, in order to raise, to lift this R star. So this was also a message. And um, for, for, the, for, for, the, for the, um, the day, uh, uh, the, the, the day of, uh, of the ECB, uh, Ricardo mentioned um, Isabel Schnabel, no, it was Guntram that mentioned Isabel Schnabel. And I also was very much impressed when she said that uh, fiscal policy actually is a transmission channel of monetary policy. Uh, which, so today we have the image of a fiscal dominance. Everybody talks about fiscal dominance. And in her words, it's like monetary dominance because monetary policy is going to hijack um, uh, fiscal policy, uh, well, in a sense. So I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, a, a word about debt maturity, because in theory, everybody would agree with you, Ricardo, uh, that extending the, the debt maturity uh, very quickly is the way to go. However, there are constraints in that, because especially when you are a big country, you need uh, to supply the safe asset along the whole yield curve. So uh, you still need to issue three months, one year, etc. cetera. Uh, hence, you cannot extend very, very quickly. So a way to, to do a big jump would be if the ECB could 
perhaps say that that it's going to to buy 50 year bonds so <laughs> this could incentivize uh, um, fiscal authorities to issue more long term but at this stage and and then uh, theoretically i have a question about uh, the risk management because if you think that interest rate is going to increase when there is a recovery then it means that r and y are positively correlated so then the argument in terms of extending the maturity to pre to, to lock uh, interest rate is less is less uh, convincing because you know that the day the interest rate goes up it you have more fiscal uh, uh, revenues, um, to, tax revenues. Um, and uh, and just to finish, um, so uh, about what Guntram said, say Palais, Standard Bury and summer, Summers are they are on our side because basically what they say is that at the edge, uh, uh, the macro doesn't work any longer. The IS curve is... Uh, uh, becomes upward sloping and things and notice things like that so uh, i so this goes uh, in favor of the of the narrative of the middle of the road and uh, also um the fact that so uh, guntram mentioned the con debt cancellation uh debate well kind of debate um maybe also there's a, a political risk when you are at the edge uh, that people start because there is no longer any uh, policy space, people start being very creative. And, and we, so this is also maybe something to take into account when you <laughs> go to the edge of the road and then you have new, uh, very uh, uh, um, attractive uh, theories that pop up. And, uh, and this makes the life of policymakers uh, more difficult. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Uh, discussion is very interesting, and I would love to have one more hour to discuss with everyone. But I have to discipline myself, and we already over the time. So, unless there is oh, sorry, I was too long. It's not your fault, no one. <laughs> unless there is any crucial final remark by someone else. Uh, so I just want to thank all of you. And just mention that a couple of things we have. We want to talk also about the next crisis uh, soon. And we know what is the next crisis this time. is the uh, demographic tsunami in all the countries that they have social security systems which are unsustainable. So we're going to have a small mini conference with the Bank of Spain uh, on the April 8th about this issue, and in particular because it can be a good way to use the resources of the next generation. And, and then also, you know, we're gonna have the fifth uh, ADEMO uh, workshop in the summer forum of the personal GS in June, but I put it here because the deadline for the submissions is next in 10 days, March 14. Thanks to all of you for Zooming and joining us will be other occasions. And thanks in particular for the authors and the finalists for all the discussion. This has been recorded so people can just get back to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>